Please note, there is discussion throughout this video regarding the need for genetic testing to determine which specific type of albinism you or your loved one may have. When doctors provide a name to your condition, it is important to determine whether it is an anatomical description or a genetic diagnosis. For example, every person with albinism has ocular albinism where ocular is simply an anatomical descriptor describing the condition as of or connected with the eyes. A genetic diagnosis of ocular albinism can only be determined through genetic testing. Presently, more often, the genetic diagnosis of ocular albinism is X-linked and therefore only occurs in males. If your genetic diagnosis is inconclusive, NOAA and the HPS network are resources. Contact NOAA at info at albinism.org or contact HPS network at info at hpsnetwork.org. But thank you all for coming. Um, I think, I guess the next step would be just to, to hand it on over to our two awesome hosts here tonight. We're so glad to have here and I will let you introduce yourselves. So thank you for being here. All right. Thank you, Casey. Uh, so I am Pam Tarnawa. I am uh, a teacher of students with visual impairments. I live in Massachusetts. Uh, I have a eight-year-old son with ocular albinism, as well as two older brothers and my grandfather and his twin brother also had it. Um, I am a parent liaison with NOAA, and I've been working with them over, I want to say about the last year, to increase some visibility around OA, and uh, Dr. Lewis has been very generous with his time working with me to create an informational bulletin about ocular albinism that will go up on the website next week, um, and without further ado, Dr. Lewis. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dick Lewis. I'm a board-certified ophthalmologist originally from Massachusetts. If there's anybody uh, from that region um, on board tonight, um, I grew up in uh, in Massachusetts, went to undergraduate school there at Harvard, went to the University of Michigan Medical School, which you'll hear a little bit more about later on, and was recruited to Baylor College of Medicine um, in 1979, where I've been ever since. Uh, my specialty is ophthalmology. My interest has always been in genetics and inherited eye disease. And I've been blessed to work with some truly talented people, uh, including those that ultimately identified the gene for X-linked ocular albinism. Pam, would you like me to just proceed from here? Uh, yeah, let's see how many people we have so far. About 15 people. Yeah. I mean, if you're ready to start, I think we're ready. I will be preface this by saying if anybody wants to stay beyond the quote hour, end quote, as long as Casey and Pam will stay with me and the machine will stay on, I'm happy to answer questions since I have a tendency to talk and talk and talk and talk. So yes, we can have, certainly stay on past if, the hour. If questions come up and you want to put them in the chat, please do. And Pam is going to be monitoring the chat for questions that need to be answered straight away and saved for later for answering at the end. Uh, with that in mind, if my, now what? Well, folks, it worked a minute ago when we started. There we go. Uh, the discussion this evening is not a substitute for a formal professional evaluation. And I have no personal or financial interest in the topics discussed, except my historical role in some of them. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts to reveal. And my role is only that as an occasional consultant and advisor to NOAA and its tremendous membership. I'm speaking to you from Houston, Texas. Um, I'm at home at the moment, but this is an overview of the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the United States. As you can see in the mid portion of the left hand uh, side of the screen, the uh, construction crane is the national bird of Houston. And um, this medical center is expanding tremendously at the moment. Um, and we've been very fortunate to work with some incredibly talented people here. The topic this evening is albinism, specifically ocular albinism. For those of you who forget or didn't have the privilege of having basic language skills in high school, the word derives from the Latin adjective albus aum, which means white, 
and properly refers to dead white. There is another word, another adjective for shining or glittering white. And in this case, specifically with reference to hair, complexion, garments, and so forth. To state, to lay out the big picture, albinism is a reasonably large group of genetic disorders in which the cells in the tissues, particularly called melanocytes, are distributed normally throughout the skin and the hair and the eye, but they do not synthesize, they do not manufacture an adequate amount of melanin which is the classic brown uh, pigment, which affects our normal skin, hair, eyes, tanning, so forth and so forth. Albinism is not unique to humans. Almost every animal and some other things on this planet have been described to have albinism at one degree or another. Here are a couple of simple examples, some of which you'd rather not meet in the dark. Um, oh. Melanocytes, are the cells responsible for melanin pigment production. And interestingly, they are normal in number and distribution in people with albinism, but they don't manufacture enough of that pigment. Enough of that pigment that looks like this. They will not be a quiz um, on, and I will not call on any of you to actually describe what's going on here in a biochemical way. But the point of this slide is the chemical manufacturing of melanin is an extraordinarily complex biochemical phenomenon. And a number of different chemicals and a number of different enzymes are required to make this product. So when some component along the assembly line goes bad, the final product is either not made or is not made in sufficient quantity or is not made properly to provide all of the full pigmentation that normal melanin will give you. The typical features of albinism are less than normal pigment in the skin, hair, and eyes. In the eye, infantile onset nystagmus, meaning a rhythmic, usually horizontal, occasionally rotatory movement of the eyes, which is uncontrollable. And notice I said infantile, not congenital. Congenital means present at birth. It is very unusual. I'd be interested to hear from the families here uh, about your own personal experiences. It's very unusual for a child to manifest this rhythmic, uncontrolled ocular oscillation at birth. Typically, it begins anywhere from four to eight weeks after birth. And another characteristic feature is translumination of the iris, which I'll show you in a moment. This is a cross-section of the eye. The iris is this structure up here at the behind the cornea. The cornea is the watch crystal in the front part of the eye. The iris, like the shutter on a camera, is that mobile structure which allows light to come in through the pupil, through the lens, and then go into the back of the eye to the retina, which lines the inside back two thirds of the eye, the same as film uh, lines the inside of a camera. That transparent retina, which is about the thickness of saran wrap, sits on top of a pigmented layer called the retinal pigment epithelium. And since I already told you that's pigmented, the pigment is melanin, and in all forms of albinism, the amount of and distribution of melanin in that layer is altered in all forms of uh, albinism. We'll come back to that in a moment. Here is a nice normal blue iris. If I now take a camera and shine light through the pupil, it hits the inside of the back of the eye, gets reflected forward. And if you reduce the illumination in the room, you can see that the background of the iris is now transilluminated. That red hue is the reflected light coming through the altered iris because on the back surface of the iris, there is a layer of cells similar to the pigment epithelium underneath the retina, which contains pigment. And when that pigment is deficient, the light comes through the iris, which it does not in a normal individual. The other components of albinism from the visual perspective is abnormal visual acuity, the exact reason for which is still not fully understood. Even under the best circumstances, it is extremely unusual for any form of, of any person with albinism to see 2020 corrected with appropriate correction. Under development of the center vision area, here referred to as the fovea, and as I mentioned, under pigmentation, hypopigmentation, 
of the background of the of the fundus, the background of the eye inside of the eye. And there's some other things about projections of information from the optic nerve to the brain, which we're not going to discuss tonight. This is a normal right eye. This circle over here on the right is an optic nerve. In real life terms, that's about a millimeter and a half in diameter, cross-sectionally. This is a nice normal looking retina of an aging physician who occasionally gives lectures for NOAA. Incidentally, I have a small freckle or mole here, um, which has no effect on my vision. And this is the center vision area right here. When you're looking at this part of the retina, in my eye, you're using your fovea, or your center vision area to look at it. Here on the other hand, is a person who is making almost no, no pigment at all. So you're looking through the transparent retina, through the transparent retinal pigment epithelium to the layer of blood vessels underneath there, which is called the choroid. And all of these tangle of blood vessels back here are normal, but in large choroidal vessels because you can't see the capillaries that connect them. I use that as reference for the future of things. So we're gonna arbitrarily quickly discuss and branch the difference between ocular cutaneous albinism and ocular albinism, and notice I put it in quotes. The first form of albinism that involves both the eye and the skin, oculocutaneous, <laughs> now OCA, oculocutaneous albinism, was found many years ago at, to be caused by the deficiency of a, an enzyme called tyrosinase, which is the very first point in the assembly of that huge melanin um, molecule that I showed you. And when that enzyme is not present, the rest of the system doesn't work and no melanin is produced. As a consequence, people have white skin that doesn't tan, white hair, and that white hair persists throughout life. It never gets darker. And uh, this lady's eyelashes are not really her own She's amplified them, but girls tend to do that, my mom told me. And skin, the things that look like freckles here are freckles, but they're red. They're not pigmented because that lady that I just showed you does not manufacture any melanin. And this is the back of her eye, again, showing the deficiency of pigment and the, just the, the glow through the normal retinal blood vessels, which are these major vessels here. Um, and the complex of vessels in the back of the eye. There's a variant of this where some tyrosinase is made, but it, it leaks. So these folks have a uh, very light yellow uh, skin and hair. Uh, but again, you see the pigment deficiency in the iris. And here's another lady with the same um, yellow albinism. The hair is real. The brows and the lashes are not real. And there's her eye to give you an idea that, that looks very similar, uh, different gene. And then uh, a second type of oculocutaneous albinism is uh, caused by a deficiency of another gene called the P gene. And in those people, again, the skin is fairly light. The eyes tend to be blue or at the very worst, a little teeny bit of pigment, but transillumination, the nystagmus, which I can't show you in a still photograph, but notice the color of his hair. The color of his hair is real. And here's an, an older gentleman with the same variant and another lady, her hair is real, but again, ladies, I'm sorry, her brows and her lashes are not real. My mommy taught me that. The girls do that sometimes. And here's her fundus, which shows a little more pigment than I showed you before, less visibility of those choroidal vessels, but still very blonde, if you want me to use that term. And a third variety of oxygenous albinism in which another gene, TYRP, forget what those albinism soup stands for, uh, create a different appearance. Um, and um, there's brown albinism, which is fairly common in those of African descent, particularly from Nigeria and Ghana. Um, and here's a security guard uh, who was a patient of mine who works at the hospital next door to us, this is not someone, despite her look, this is not someone you would not want to tackle uh, in the middle of a street or anything. She will take you down in about a half a second. Uh, <laughs> lovely lady. <laughs> but, and to give you a sense of what her skin looks like, even with her African ancestry, and that's her arm in the middle compared to a, a, a Caucasian arm on the top, and her 
brother, I mean, sorry, her sister, who has normal um, uh, pigmentation. And there's her iris with a little brown. I don't have an iris transformation photograph. Uh, but again, you can see how much more pigment there is in her retina, uh, even though she does have other features of ocular albinism. Uh, and that's so-called brown albinism. But a variant of this will also call rufous or red hair albinism. And this young man, you can tell, has red hair, although the photograph's a bit faded, uh, and freckles, which are reddish rather than brownish. So let's talk about the other type of albinism, uh, which is only one, and I keep putting the parentheses, I'm sorry, the uh, quotation marks around the word ocular. For those of you who can't read the legend on the cartoon, the two bears are talking to one another and said, it's Vince, all right. It's his nose, his mouth, his fur, but his eyes. There's something not quite right about his eyes. Ocular albinism is a non-progressive disorder of melanocin biogenesis, meaning, again, the generation of pigment by the melanocytes. Not enough melanin is manufactured, but with more subtle features than the things I've just showed you in ocular cutaneous albinism, less severe, less um, obvious in the skin, the hair, and the eyes. It's estimated that this condition has a frequency in the population, at least in North America, uh, in about one in 60,000. I'm not sure I believe those numbers because usually they're just made up. But the same general features of other types of albinism persist. Infantile onset nystagmus, less than normal visual acuity. Remember, this is stationary. This never gets worse. It's not normal but it doesn't deteriorate. Less than normal pigmentation in the iris and the retinal pigment epithelium and underdevelopment of the center vision area in the retina. The key to this story, and I'll show you more of it in a moment, is that the reduced pigmentation in the skin and the hair is compared to unaffected family members. And that's why this was overlooked for so long and got the name ocular albinism, because the eye features are more obvious than the skin and hair features, especially for ophthalmologists who look at faces and don't look at skin and hair and eyebrows and eyelashes. Um, and among its other features, in addition, we know that many people with albinism have refractive areas and require glasses because they're either unusually nearsighted, unusually farsighted, or have unusual degrees of astigmatism. We will talk about what that means later if somebody wants to know what astigmatism is. Um, less than normal use of both eyes together at the same time, binocular vision, and crossed eyes, usually crossed in, uh, sometimes crossed out, but strabismus is the global word for the eyes aren't aligned uh, in parallel with one another. X-linked ocular albinism, which is the only true type of ocular albinism and only the only single gene for ocular albinism, has been named after two historical individuals, Dr. Neville Ship and Dr. Falls, whom I will introduce to you in a moment. The hair is typically blonde, not white at birth, but does in many people progress to tan or darker, even brown. The skin is light and does tend to burn, but often freckled. And tanning, and the, again, this slide was made for another purpose, type 1 and type 2 tanning means folks with this condition invariably sunburn before they tan. They're very sensitive to sunlight. Type 1 is very similar to people with ocular cutaneous albinism type 1, where they manufacture no pigment and therefore are always at risk for sunburning. And the color of the eyes starts typically blue, at least in European-American individuals, and progresses to uh, blue with brown overlay or tan or hazel and sometimes brown. Um, brown pigment in the iris, I'm sorry, blue pigment in the iris is a relatively new event in human evolution. Up until about 12,000 years ago, everyone had brown eyes. This is Dr. This is Dr. Edward Nettleship, after whom the first uh, eponym of the compound arose. He was an English physician and ophthalmologist who trained at the most famous eye hospital in London, Moorfields. 
Uh, he was the person who attended Queen Victoria's cataract. Hold on to Queen Victoria. I'm going to talk more about her in a moment. And he retired in 1902 at the age of 57. And he must have been very successful to do that. The interesting part is that very shortly after that, in 1908, he published a manuscript uh, in the transaction of the Ophthalmological Society of the United Kingdom entitled On Some Hereditary Diseases of the Eye. And in that, he describes a number of families that he had examined with the condition that we now call ocular albinism. Notice this from 1909. The note of all these cases, the men, children, uh, males, is blue or gray iris, hair now brown, but with the history that it was very fair or even, quote, white, end quote, in early childhood, and a more or less albinotic fundus, which I showed you a moment ago, almost all have nystagmus and marked amblyopia, meaning uh, they cannot be corrected in normal vision. That's why how he used the word amblyopia then. And here is a copy of the published pedigree from that article. The men affected are the circles with the carrot on top in the line that are blacked in. And you'll notice that no male has an affected son. Affected sons are connected to their grandfather through the father, the grandfather's daughter. And the same thing in the lower figure, 55. And Nettleship said the descent through the pedigree was through the mother in every case. No affected male ever had an affected child. And he used the term incomplete ocular albinism, even though he had emphasized the difference in the text. And that's where the term ocular albinism started, which is very confusing. Now, the second part of the eponym in Eldership Falls is attributed to this gentleman. Harold Falls was a graduate of the University of Michigan at five feet, six inches tall, he was on the University of Michigan basketball team, which proves that that sport has changed since the 1930s. Went to the University of Michigan Medical School and went from there uh, to become an, uh, an ophthalmology resident and then junior faculty. And in 1943, became the medical director of the Department of Human Heredity. This is the Human Heredity Clinic that used to exist on Catherine Street down the hill from the original University Hospital. That is the very first human heredity clinic in the United States dedicated to human genetic disease. And Dr. Falls was the second director of that clinic. And it's the only time in American history when a Department of Human Genetics, 1946-47, grew out of a heredity clinic directed by an ophthalmologist. Here are one of my adult patients with ocular, uh, sorry, with ocular albinism. Notice the fact that he does tan a bit and his hair is medium to dark brown. There's his fundus, right eye. And this is another of his relatives who has a bit graying on the sides, but almost black brown hair. Nystagmus, reduced visual acuity. In 1951, Dr. Falls described something very unusual about the women who were obligate carries, carriers of the gene in these families with X-linked ocular albinism. Here is an outtake of a set of hand drawings. We didn't have fundus cameras to take pictures of the retina in uh, 1947, 48, 50, 51. An affected male on the, I'm sorry, an affected, I'm sorry, a, a female on the top, the, uh, and then uh, a, the square is an effect, affected male, his daughter below that, and her son at the bottom in the square, um, hand-drawn, painted, um, to show the differences. And although the first picture is a little bit difficult, you'll see some sort of streaky pigment lines in the two females, more obvious than the one on the very top rather than the one that's third down. I'll show you some photographs more specifically in a moment. 
1951, in the manuscript describing this phenomenon, he writes, Dr. Falls writes, I support the postulation of an X chromosome gene, a gene on the X chromosome, intermediate in its expression in the female and exhibiting its full effect when present in the single unopposed locus in the male. Here we're going to talk about genetics. And as soon as we start talking about genetics, a certain portion of the audience starts getting real uncomfortable. Sorry about the uh, cartoon, but it seems to me so appropriate in some situations. All right. This is an X-linked disorder. As you may remember from high school biology, girls are called girls because they have two sex-determining chromosomes, which historically are referred to as X chromosomes. Males have one X and a little short stubby thing called a Y chromosome. The information on that Y chromosome makes them male. If there's a genetic condition on the only X chromosome that man has, he will be tasked with the future of developing that X-linked condition. X-linked because it's on the X chromosome. The gene is locked into that X chromosome. For the sake of simplicity, we painted, or the artist here painted the X chromosome with the abnormal gene on it, orange. If dad passes on his Y chromosome, regardless of which of mom's X's she transmits, the first two on the left in the lower row, those are both boys because his Y chromosome, dad's Y chromosome makes them male. Since mom's X chromosomes are normal, each of those two males is normal for this particular trait. However, if mom, if dad hands on his X chromosome to the first girl, number three in the bottom row, and mom hands on the X chromosome on the left side, that child is XX, XX is a girl, and that girl is a carrier for that X chromosome with the not working gene on it. The same thing applies to the fourth girl. Dad passes on his X with the gene with the aberrant gene on it. Mom hands on her other X. That child becomes XX. That's a girl. And that girl is a carrier because she's carrying that genetic aberration inside her. So all of his daughters are carriers but do not have the condition. None of his sons inherit the condition because they got his normal Y chromosome. I hope that's clear to everybody. The complement to that is what happens if dad, without the condition, marries a lady who is a carrier. Um, and uh, forgive the spaghetti lines, but again, if dad hands on his Y chromosome and mom hands on her normal X, each of those kids, I mean, I'm sorry, the, if mom hands on her normal X and dad hands on his Y chromosome, that first child on the bottom row is XY, that's a boy. The X chromosome is normal. That boy does not have the condition. Dad hands on his Y chromosome to the second child. Mom hands on her X with the gene on it. That child is XY. XY is a boy. The only X information he has has the abnormal condition on it, uh, abnormal gene on it, and therefore that child will develop ocular albinism. And the third possibility is dad hands on his X, his only X. Mom hands on her normal X. That child is XX. XX, two X's is a girl. Both X's are normal. That girl does not have the condition and she's not a carrier. And the only other possibility is Dad hands on his only X, which is normal. Mom hands on her X that has the gene on it, the gene aberration on it. That child is XX. Sex is a girl, and that girl is a carrier just as her mother is. So in this situation, each male child has one chance of two to be affected, and each female offspring of that carrier mom has one chance in two to be a carrier and one chance to be genetically normal normal. And we use the term carrier to refer to someone who has a pair of genes, which includes one normal copy and one not normal copy, or in this case, mutant copy. Now, people have noticed, as Dr. Falls did in 1951, that 
there are some subtle appearances for some excellent conditions. And we refer to that as a carrier state, something that's observable. So carrier state is an often subtle appearance or manifestation of that single mutant copy of a gene in a female, detectable either by an examination, in this case, or by an appropriate test, genetic or otherwise. Case in point, the gentleman on your left is uh, in his late 40s, has best corrected visual acuity of about 2040, has tan brown hair, has had nystagmus since shortly after birth, uh, always sunburns, but does tan to a degree. He was unaware of having any explanation or diagnosis for his condition during his whole life. He has three daughters. Daughter number one is the girl in the middle of the three girls in the back row. Uh, she has two children out of wedlock, one male and one female, neither of whom has any ocular conditions. Daughter number two is the lady, the blondish lady on the far right picture. She uh, has two children out of wedlock, one male and one female, and neither of them has any vision problems or behavioral issues or vision issues. Daughter number three is the lady closest to dad with the dark frame glasses on. She gets married and her first child is a son who develops nystagmus at about five weeks after birth, has iris translumination, uh, hypopigmentation, and so forth and so forth. Do you get the feeling this is an X-linked ocular albinism family? Here's dad. You can see his eyes are not uh, straight on a line. He does have crossed eyes. His right eye is his better eye than his left eye. Here is his iris, partly dilated, hence the big orange glow. But you can see around the rim of the picture over here on the on the, the uh, left side of the screen, his iris transilluminates. And I don't have a picture of his fundus. This is uh, the older daughter. And here is her fundus. Notice this splotchy, some people refer to it as um, mud spattered, uh, coloration. It's irregular from place to place. Some dark pigmented, some hypopigmented patches in the retinal pigment epithelium. Here's daughter number two, and here's her funded, a little more blonde than her older sister, but the same blotchiness with areas that are hyperpigmented, relatively speaking, and other areas that are hypopigmented. And here's daughter number three with exactly the same um, appearance. Um, but a little bit more coloration between them. So what are the criteria for X-link inheritance? Number one, the condition, the trait does not appear in successive generations. In other words, males do not transmit to males. It has to go through a second generation down before it appears again, if there happened to be an intervening female carrier. Second, the frequency of the trait is much higher in males. In fact, almost exclusively, but not always males. The trait is never transmitted from father to son because father the son gets father's Y chromosome, not his X chromosome. Affected males transmit the trait through all of their daughters to half of the daughter's sons. That's the cartoon we went through a few minutes ago, said a little differently. And affected males in a multi-generational family are either brothers because they got the same gene from their mother or related to one another through females who are carriers of the gene in one or more generation i don't think we need to go through that again i'll skip that but wait a minute sometimes there was no family history witness the gentleman that i presented in the with the three daughters this term, no family history, means one of two things, no family or no history, because the physicians or people who inquired didn't dig deep enough into it or there isn't any information. Leave aside the consanguinity story because it's not relevant to excellent ocular albinism. No family history. We went to dinner this week with a couple that we've known for quite some time. She was 50 years old when her mother told her that she was adopted. She had not known that her entire life until she was 50 years old. Now, suppose her mom had died, 
and had never told her, there would still be no family history on that side of the family. Third possibility, non-paternity. Non-paternity means that the designated father is not the real biological father of a child. Based on blood group of analysis and so forth in large cities like New York City, about six or seven percent of people who claim their father are not really their biological father. In Salt Lake City, it's less than one half of one percent, and I think you can probably guess why the difference. Fourth possibility, a new event. Mom and dad are normal, but when the genetic material got transmitted to that child, male or female, the genetic information was altered, and there's a mutation in that generation. And one of the things that enhances that risk is advanced age of the father. Here's an example. Uh, well, that, that's non-paternity. The, the outcome is not expected. We'll come to that later. I couldn't find the slide I really wanted to show you, but if you look up here to the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that this is the pedigree of Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, who transmitted through Victoria the gene for hemophilia in multiple royal families in Europe because Queen Victoria was a carrier for hemophilia, which is an X-linked disease, affects only males. And she passed out a number of her daughters to royal families in Spain, uh, in Russia, in Prussia, in uh, uh, England, and in Germany. Um, and the, 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 the watchword is uh, Queen Victoria waged biological warfare in the royal houses of Europe. Now, this family is very well understood going back to the Battle of Hastings, 1666. There is no antecedent history of hemophilia before this male, Leopold, who was an affected son of Queen Victoria. And because there were multiple people here, we can backtrack that Queen Victoria must have been the origin of that gene variant. What is not on this slide, and I... I couldn't find the right slide. Edward, Duke of Kent, who was the father of Queen Victoria, was 56 years old when she was born. In biological terms, that's really old. And there is an increased risk of new mutational events in genes in the offspring of older age group fathers. Whereas there are chromosomal abnormalities Down syndrome and so forth in the offspring of older age group mothers. These are single gene variants because girls reproduce uh, uh, produce eggs differently than the way boys produce sperm. Girls are a mosaic. All girls are a mosaic genetically. They have two X chromosomes. A sperm fuses with an egg that creates a conception. That cell grows up and divides and becomes two cells. Two cells grow up and become four. Four become eight. Eight becomes 16. 16, 32, 32 to 64. Somewhere between 128 and 256 cells in a developing embryo, <clears throat> God, in her infinite wisdom, said, I cannot have two X chromosomes talking and unraveling and passing out genetic information in every single cell. So at that point, an event which is called commitment occurs, and one or the other of those two X chromosomes in every single cell is committed to become inactive, and only the active X is transcribed with the genetic information contained on it. Now, with 256 cells, it would be extraordinarily unusual that 255 of them would commit one and only one would commit the other cell to be inactive. So, you know, it's going to be a mixture, and we're, you're always in the 40, 50, 60% range, just on a probabilistic basis, that half of, plus or minus half of the X chromosomes will be the normal X active, and half of them will be the not normal X active. As a consequence, females who are carriers are a mosaic of cells, and the inactive X chromosome may randomly be paternal or maternal once it evolves, 
But once the clonal descendants of that committed cell occurs, the subsequent cells have the same X consistently inactive. And necessarily, as I just said, the proportion of abnormal cells vary, and specific tissues may, may contain different fractions of those anomalous cells. Here is a young lady who is a carrier, I won't show her fundus, uh, of X-linked ocular albinism. There is her iris transillumination. I'm sorry, I did have a picture of a fundus. If you look out in here in the periphery, she does have this same mosaic uh, in the fundus. Here's a better picture of it in the superior portion of the right eye. And here's the inferior portion. So you get the idea. There's her fundus. And one other thing, because remember, skin has melanocytes in it as well. Do you see this segmental area of hypopigmentation, which never tans in her skin? That particular area of skin developed from a clone that kept the not normal X um, active. Uh, and therefore, that sector of skin produces much less melanin than the normal cells surrounding it everywhere. Uh, that's a picture of Dr. Falls in his subsequent years. We were had the privilege of um, developing a collegiate professorship in his name. That's Dick Lewis on the left and Paul Seaving, the immediate past director of the National Eye Institute on the right at the University of Michigan some years ago. Um, so ocular albinism, the implications are when considering an X-linked diagnosis in a male for which there is a recognizable carrier state in a female, aka mother, it is incumbent upon the attending physician to examine the available at-risk females for that carrier state. What I just said was, if you have a male and whom you suspect you as an ophthalmologist or whatever, suspect is X-linked ocular albinism and there is a recognizable carrier state, which I've shown you multiple pictures of, it is incumbent on that attending ophthalmologist to examine the mother, if this is a child or if it's an adult and the grandmother is deceased, if he, that gentleman has a daughter, examine the daughter because that daughter is an obligate carrier. And do all carriers, do are all carriers female? Um, sometimes some funny things happen in nature. And there are a few situations where people who look like females are not. There is a condition called Turner syndrome. Um, I'm not trying to teach you biology, but these start out as boys, as 46 chromosomes XY, and the early cells lost the Y chromosome. So they develop as females, external genitalia and so forth, but they have some other features, a short stature and so forth. But if they have an abnormality on that only X, they're going to manifest the trait. You can imagine, just as the young lady whose skin I showed you, if for some reason a normal female with two X's skews the inactivation of the normal X so that the very few of the normal X's are active, the abnormal X's will take over and she should show more substantial and more obvious features of being a carrier. And there's a very rare condition called um, androgen insensitivity, where uh, females um, have a genetic mutation where they're not sensitive to uh, testosterone. Um, here is a notable example of a very famous individual um, who is supposed to have androgen insensitivity. And you can see why at age 60, there's a lot of features about her face that look masculine to me. Um, but I can't prove it because I've not examined her as a patient. She is not a carrier for X-linked ocular albinism. OA1 is the only gene known to be associated with X-linked ocular albinism, and here is the original publication from a group of us at Baylor a number of years ago when we isolated the gene and I identified it as the causative gene on the short arm of the X chromosome. So what do we do for managing people with this? The first, of course, is securing a diagnosis. It'd be interesting to talk with some of you after the discussion. I can tell you I've seen an awful lot of people over my career where someone has been labeled, sorry, labeled ocular albinism who have ocular cutaneous albinism. Not just because they're a male doesn't make it ocular. 
Obviously, there are worries about skin care. If you cannot mobilize sufficient melanin to produce a tan to protect your skin from solar damage, and then there's the issue of ophthalmic care. And from a skin care perspective, the appropriate sun protective clothing, hats with brims and so forth because of the sun light sensitivity, as true with anybody with albinism. And I will leave to a dermatologist uh, the treatment of topical skin exposed areas with sun protective lotions and sun protective formulas with an SPF of greater than 40 on the bottle um, to maximize the um, uh, dam to maximize the benefit and minimize the damage. Here's a gentleman with um, type 1 oculocutaneous albinism who has a numerous of uh, skin cancers from chronic exposure to sun. Um, and this can occur in people with uh, X-linked ocular albinism as well, but not to the same degree. Notice this hair on his forearm is white. He does have OCA1. What about children with ocular albinism, just like ocular cutaneous albinism? We recognize that they have a higher frequency of refractive errors, nearsighted, farsighted, unusual degrees of astigmatism. And that means as infants and children, first about every six months and then perhaps once a year, they need to come in, have a formal examination, get their pupils dilated, get their prescription checked. Um, if there's a notable difference between one eye and the other in visual acuity, um, which leads to, quote, lazy eye or amblyopia, that needs to be managed with patching and with other things which are beyond this discussion at this point. The photodysphoria, meaning which some people inadvertently call photophobia, um, photodysphoria means discomfort in light. Photophobia means fear of light. People with albinism are uncomfortable in bright light, but it doesn't cause pain. They're not afraid of it. Um, and um, that means appropriate use of tinted glasses or, or sunglasses, brims on the hats and so forth to minimize the discomfort in bright lights. And then watching and observing for crossed eyes, which can be managed successfully if intervened, certainly before age seven, uh, and recognized early in life in the first two or three or four years of life. So that means, as I said, proper spectacles and fitting spectacles in children is another art, um, which is uh, easy to do and so badly <laughs> managed so often. Kids in school, depending on what their level of acuity is, uh, may benefit from uh, so-called low vision support. There are magnification aids, telescopic aids, uh, bifocal correction in some kids, um, uh, and so forth. And so those aids are aids are age appropriate. Age appropriate meaning the child has to be old enough, especially for an expensive telescope, monos monoscope or something, that they uh, know how to take care of it and not lose $250 worth uh, of uh, optical aid. And photochromic lenses, which are the ones that um, are clear in dim light, but go out in the sunlight and turn gray or brown to cut down like, like sunglasses and then revert uh, four or five minutes after coming indoors um, will cut down on some of the glare and bright light problems that kids face uh, with any form of albinism. The next question is, okay, so somebody says he's got ocular albinism, how can we prove it? Well, there is an indication for testing and that's confirmation of the clinical label or the clinical diagnosis. I think your son has X-linked ocular albinism for those individuals who fit with the characteristic features. Phenotypic means the pheno comes from the Greek word phino, which means I show and typical. So the, the, they manifest or show the typical features of X-linked ocular albinism, eye, skin, hair, fundus, whatever, or retina. Um, that would also lead, of course, to the question, well, if he inherited, if he has it, where did he get it? Is he the first person in the family with X-linked ocular albinism or did he inherit it from his mother? In which case, carrier testing is important and then counseling those females at risk with or without a family history of X-linked ocular albinism. What are your chances of having? And then if you wish to avoid future pregnancies with this, depending on how your how what your view of this is, um, what types of prenatal services are available 
for a person who has an identified variant um, in the or disease associated variant in the OA1 gene. So the general recommendations for carrier testing is a mother or an at-risk female who's been examined for iris translimination and then received pupillary dilation by an ophthalmologist who's familiar with the fundus carrier state of albinism, which I've shown you. It's not that difficult to recognize, and it's nearly, in quotes, universal. Why did he say nearly universal rather than universal? Remember when I talked about mosaicism? It's perfectly possible that the cells that form that retinal pigment epithelium in the back of that mom's eyes just happen to skew out and shut down the majority of the cells with the abnormal X active and kept the normal X active in those cells and therefore the subtlety may be there and, and overlooked, especially in the periphery. So you've really got to get a, an ophthalmologist who will dilate the pupil, get a big view and a broad view of the whole inside of the eye, not just look straight back through an undilated pupil in the office. And then a detailed family history um, uh, about that, the findings on that examination of the mother um, uh, or affected relative depending should be reported to the laboratory when a sample is sent for testing. Um, this, if anybody wants to make notes of it, uh, you can go to this website, genetest.org, and plug in, for example, X-linked ocular albinism or Nettleship Falls ocular albinism and find out what laboratories are available to do the testing. Most of the time, you need to work through a professional. Um, my bias around the country is to start with a certified genetic counselor who can advise the family about the risks um, and benefits of doing testing and the things that you may find during the testing. And here's the website for the uh, National Society for Genetic Counselors. Um, and you just go to the website and I think there's a search box where you plug in state or city and state and it'll give you names that are within XYZ miles and you can do 10 mile, 25 mile, 50 mile radius and so forth and find uh, people to talk to. And then if you need a physician, meaning a geneticist for uh, to deal with the medical genetic aspects of this and genetic formal testing, um, the American College of Medical Genetics has a similar network available online. And again, there is a search engine where you can plug in the city, state, and so forth um, to find uh, persons uh, whose offices you can call and talk to. And my favorite, of course, is the National Foundation for Albinism and Hypopigmentation. Some of you have heard the story of where the H came from because they struggled, a group of ladies, I think it was in New York City, struggled with how are they going to tie this together. And the, the semi-apocryphal story was that they were meeting with a gentleman from the University of Minnesota by the name of Carl Whitkop, a geneticist who had an interest in albinism. And he was the one who came up with the H. And the acronym was focused on the reality that some of the Old Testament descriptions of Noah, with or without the ark, had white hair and white beard. And so it was inferred that he may have had albinism. I think it's a long reach, but nonetheless. The double amusement here for me is that Carl Whitkop was Dutch ancestry and his surname Witkop in Dutch translates as white cow. Um, DNA diagnosis is available. There are multiple institutions and multiple laboratories that do fee-for-service testing uh, since albinism is caused by more than one gene, um, not OA one, but since albinism by itself is caused by more than one gene, you are usually subjected to a multi-gene panel, which screens dozens of genes at the same time and looks for misspellings or alterations uh, in genes that may cause, in this case, OA1. And typically, um, although there is a current popularity for doing this with a cheek swab, particularly in infants, I like real blood because you have a lot more DNA in white blood cells than you do in cheek uh, um, cheek swabs. 
And the other problem with cheek swabs is it has to be done correctly. And one of the correctly is that the child must not eat or drink anything for at least two hours before the cheek is swabbed because you don't want the laboratory to do analysis on hamburger or something that was left over from the child's last meal. The earlier the diagnosis helps everyone to affirm the diagnosis to initiate the appropriate surveillance and management from the ocular perspective and dermatologic perspective and genetics perspective, depending on whether we're talking about a child or an adult or a reproductive age group couple. Um, and to some degree, once you have an example of an established diagnosis, the anxiety or self blame and depression that comes with the worry that I did this to my child has a biological explanation, certainly relieves a lot of uh, tension and anxiety in the family. And of course, then ultimately with a real diagnosis allows you to plan uh, family in the future. And an earlier diagnosis also provides both the immediate family and the extended families, siblings of the parents and so forth, an accurate prognosis and reality that this is a stationary disorder which can be managed like a lot of things that I deal with as an ophthalmologist, which once set in motion are deteriorating and progressive and lead to uh, legal blindness and worth and worse. So it also allows um, access to and direction toward um, family support groups for specific disorders, in this case, NOAA. And um, it also allows the family to pay attention to um, access to gene-specific research and, and therapeutic structures, which are not quite available yet for X-linked ocular albinism, but have been worked on, uh, both by some people at the NIH National Eye Institute and some other things in cells, trying to decide what can we do to alter this altered gene in OA1. And that's a couple of things that have been published recently, which while only in experimental cell situations and only experimental animal situations, I think over the next five to 10 years, we'll have some real impact on human care. And yes, for those people who are fortunate enough to live in a state where you can alter a pregnancy and um, if the parents elect to terminate an affected pregnancy with a genetic disorder, uh, you can make yourself available for that. Unfortunately, we can't do that in Texas anymore because of the last legislature uh, restricting termination after six weeks of uh, pregnancy. Um, it would then allow for counseling on the pattern of inheritance, who's at risk, uh, what are the risks of having an affected child, what are the risks of a, having a carrier child, what happens as these kids grow up, and as I said, the risks of recurrence in subsequent pregnancies or subsequent generations. I think some of this is redundant, um, so I don't think I need to repeat all of it. And I think this reproductive um, stuff that gets into prenatal diagnosis is probably beyond what I want to talk about tonight. I will go back to Dr. Falls, where I began part of this presentation. In a set of papers in 1949 at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, Dr. Falls wrote, the future holds the explanation. Let us hasten the day of understanding through careful study and analysis of all affected families by the joint activity of the ophthalmologist, the physiologist, the geneticist, the chemist, in this case, I would say the geneticist and the molecular uh, chemist, and the internist. Very prophetic. Think where we are now compared to 1950. In his Jackson Memorial Lecture at the American Academy of Ophthalmology in 1954, the invasion of the biochemist, I would say molecular biochemist now, or the geneticist, into ophthalmic research is a most welcome and needed event, since it is anticipated that by this marriage, the clinician will become better informed as to the specific enzymatic or hormonal pathophysiology occurring in many of these diseases. I will reveal an additional reason for my worshiping this man. He was the University of Michigan Medical School class of 1936. My mother was University of Michigan Medical School class of 1938. I was a medical student at the University of Michigan when Dr. Falls revealed to me that he and my mother dated while they were in medical school. 
<laughs> so the real question now is, have I covered everything? And if there's anything that I haven't and you'd like to talk about, now's the opportunity. Pam, are there questions in the chat group or hands raised? Uh, there are a couple. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, let's see here. One question from Melissa is, does the vision acuity tend to get better or vision stays the same for life? Um, that, that's a good question. And it's a hard question to answer because it's not been studied in a rigorous way. Uh, the answer to that is, number one, you can't take a good visual acuity on a three-month-old. <laughs> you can kind of guess, but you can't nail it down. Um, in general, though, with ocular albinism, there's a tendency, and this is now experiential tendency. This is not fact uh, welded in steel. My experience has been there's a tendency for these kids to improve acuity on the chart both because they're growing up and understanding the alphabet and the numbers and wanting to learn, you know, answer voluntarily what they see, but also as they get from six and seven years old into the mid-teens, they make more pigment. And as they make more pigment, their acuity improves to some level. Now, it, as again, I said earlier, it never gets to normal ever, but that's not the point. The critical part of this story was it is never deteriorating. But it's better to have two good eyes or two eyes of nearly equal acuity than to ignore a crossed eye and have a kid develop amblyopia that isn't treated before the age of seven. And by that point, all the wiring diagram to the brain is welded closed and you can't fix it. So the answer is early surveillance, continuing surveillance, monitoring, changes of glasses on a six month to one year period as the kid gets older and then on up into late teens annually. And then when they get to the early 20s, you can go every other year. Um, but no, this is a stationary and, and so to some degree acuity improves. Now, maybe going from 2070 to 2050, but that's still a combination of learning and probably physiologic improvement. I've also heard uh, from a young age that vision is continuing to develop until you're around five years old. Have you heard uh, that? Six or seven. Six or seven. Okay. Yeah. By that point, the, the wiring diagram from the retina to the brain to the occiput where the visual cortex is welded closed. Um, another question we had, uh, somebody's father was 45. She was asking if that was old. You're asking me, I'm old. So the answer to that question is, um, old, biologically old has two implications, uh, two, two inferences. One is biological age, and contemporary age. In other words, it's a statistical phenomenon that is based on two things, population and chronology. After the Second World War and after the Korean War, the average age of fathers went down as boys came back. Uh, well, they went up during the war and then came down after the war. Uh, and the same thing is true for Vietnam. Um, so it's as the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, the question is, what is the average age of fathers having children in the year in which that child was born? So there's a biological part. Yes, age 45 is old. Mm -hmm. Age 56 is old, Queen Victoria. And plus, remember, in, in colonial United States, the average age of life was 47, the average age at death, because we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have people, there were no treatments for infections, war wounds, infection, all that stuff. So there are two parts of it. One is the biological part and one is the chronologic part. Where are you in history and compared to the average age of fathers having children in that year in which that child was born? And then there's a biological phenomenon, the older the father, um, uh, the, the more likely there is a variant that is not corrected and becomes a potential disease uh, generating condition from in an older age group individual. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? I see some head nods. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, another question we have from Gwenda is, does having OA or being an OA carrier increase risk for full albinism in future generations? No. It's dependent on the variation in that particular gene and nothing else. Um, okay, this is a, another question from Terry. How and when should you parents inform their children who have ocular albinism? Inform them about what? That they have ocular albinism. That will vary intensely with the with the family and the individual child. When do you tell a child who asks, where did I come from? And when do you sit them down and go into an anatomy lesson about re reproduction? The answer is, what's age appropriate? Um, and, you know, what you do for a five-year-old is not what you do for a teenager. There, there's an element of common sense in this, too. See? Yep. And I mean, from a, um, so I work with infants and toddlers in Massachusetts who have visual impairments. And often, um, if a child has a visual impairment, they're going to, they're going to realize they're a little bit different, sure. a little bit, you know, there comes a developmental age. Um, but I, I think, you know, it comes down to each individual family and each individual parent when that, right. that time is right. I, I totally agree. Um, another question um, have any of your ocular albinism patients been able to drive a vehicle? Oh, yeah. Uh, excellent ocular albinism? Oh, yes, definitely. And e either A, because by the time they're teenagers, they're in the 20, 40, 20, 50 range, and therefore are legal in most states. Or, you know, with, with, with good uh, low vision assistance, we have a phenomenal low vision system in Houston, unfortunately, it's not with Baylor, it's with our competing institution, University of Texas. Um, we have a phenomenal low vision rehabilitation group. And so with bioptics, telescopes, and that sort of stuff, but there's a trade-off. If you're wearing a bioptic, it's like pair, uh, wearing a binocular, or like using a pair of binoculars, you have great magnification of the quarterback carrying the ball in the backfield, but you have no field of view to see him getting clipped from the back. So, yes, um, again, there are state laws that control what allows, what you can use, and um, state laws vary from place to place. Case in point, this is one of my favorite ones, folks, just bear with me. I believe, if there's anybody here from either Wisconsin or Iowa, you can correct me. In the state of Iowa and the state of Wisconsin, a person who is legally blind, 2200 or worse, can get a hunting license with a rifle as long as he or she is escorted at the time by a normal sighted individual. Please realize that people with normal sight can't tell the difference between a deer and a cow. So I'm not exactly sure how that law applies, but <laughs> it depends on the situation in the individual state. But and and anecdotally, um, again, so my grandfather and his twin brother had ocular albinism X linked. They could both drive. I yep. have two out of four brothers who have OA, and they cannot drive. Because and now I have a, an eight year old son, and uh, to be determined. So I think it it really varies from family to family and from person to person. Right, but how, what the two who cannot can't pass the vision component, right? Correct. They're legally blind. Yes. Well, now that can't be 2200. That'd be very unusual. Yeah. Have an OA patient with 2200 vision and worse. Yeah. That would be, that would be very, very unusual. Okay. Most of my OA kids range from 2040 to about 2070 or 2080. Oh, wow. That's, that's much better than my brothers and my son. Yeah. Well, also it depends that we're back to the, but that depends on the variant in the OA1 gene and, and how damaging it is. So mm. next question. Um, uh, some are just comments of trying to find the question. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Our son's ophthalmologist at Boston Children's is saying that he doesn't need surgery for his eye that turns out until we are concerned about bullying. He calls it a cosmetic surgery. It sounds like you disagree with this. 
He said correcting it too young may lead, may lead to needing more surgeries in the future. Um, well, first of all, how old is a, how old is a child? Uh, he's four. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. And that's different. Yes. Yeah. So the answer is, yeah, I, I know many of the people at Boston Children's, first of all, because I grew up in that area, but, um, and uh, the chair there is a phenomenal lady. Um, so I would, I would rock with the, the guideline. Yes. But, but not before, you know, and maybe, maybe at age six or seven, but I, I assume the surgery is being done because the eyes are crossed in, and as long as he's in the proper special correction along the way, et cetera, et cetera, and his acuity remains the same and it's not deteriorating because of uh, amblyopia, because of a poor prescription, then that's reasonable. Now, if it's if the eyes are turned out, that's a different question. Because if it's the, the success rate for eyes being turned out in humans with a single surgery um is very good crossed eyes turn in it's not a hundred percent on a single operation so it depends a lot on what the and i you know i can't comment about a specific situation because i don't know the rest of the story right. but uh, i would say if he's at boston children's you're in good hands in general Um, our son has all of the ocular albinism features, but the genetic testing was inconclusive. How can we get him a diagnosis given that? Um, he needs to be re-examined by a geneticist who wants to push the story. There is an answer. You don't have it. Interesting. I would I would find I mean, whether this was whether this was done through a panel by someone or whatever, but I get in touch with a a uh, geneticist in your area who has an interest in <clears throat> ocular disease and there are definitely ways of going to more complex steps to get an answer and and that's that's that was sort of my point at the end there you need an answer the odyssey hasn't ended yet and there are ways of getting it yes more sophisticated uh, no. testing and so forth because remember the panels are only as good as what's on the panel. And it's only as good as the mutations that are put on the panel. So they're out there to seek for misspellings in genes. Mm. And if that misspelling for that gene isn't on that panel, they can't find it. Well, right, because it's not on the panel. It's not designed to pick it up. Then you go to more sophisticated things like exomes and even genomes. But there are ways of solving that problem. That's where I would get a hold of a genetic counselor in your area and let him or her, more hers than him's, um, uh, guide you into a more uh, intimate relationship with geneticists who can solve the problem with you. And that's assuming that he really has ocular albinism, or is this really ocular cutaneous? And is the story much more complex because there are four or five other big genes that? Mm -hmm. cause that spectrum rather than just OA1. Yeah. Uh, Melissa says, my son has ocular albinism and feels like he doesn't fit in with others with full albinism and would like a group of ocular albinism peers if anyone has a son around 11. Is there a big population within NOAA that have only ocular albinism? Pam, that's uh, yours. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, Melissa, uh, this is a little bit of a, uh, of a backstory about me and my family. Um, so when my son was originally diagnosed, I did join NOAA, but we didn't really feel like we belonged because my son didn't look like the other people I saw on the NOAA website, and he has pigment. Um, so the work that I'm now trying to do through NOAA is to try to build more visibility and more, um, you know, resources for people with ocular albinism. Um, so that everybody does feel like we do belong. Um, and I, I will say like the peer group, um, when I have spoken to other parents of children, either with OCA or OA, their experiences from a vision perspective are so similar. I feel like I could have been telling the story myself. Um, so I understand what he's saying from, you know, from a hypopigmentation 
standpoint, but the, the peer groups, I really wonder. Um, and if we can develop an OA peer group, we're going to have to see how many people come out of the woodwork. Right, Karen? I love it. That would be awesome. I, I saw the note by the lady who commented her son wants to be a drum major. I was thinking that uh, I have two patients, one of whom is a physician with uh, OA, and the other runs a dress shop. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I do not believe in self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, if you don't know the term, the doctor tells you your, your son will never ride a bike, so you never buy him a bike and he never learns to ride a bike. Self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't believe in self-fulfilling prophecies. If he wants to play horn and you've got the uh, drum and you've got a backyard where you can plant him and not let the neighbors go nuts, my answer is yes, do it. Agree 500,000%, Dr. Lewis. Thank you so much for saying that. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh... Another question we have from Rebecca. Do you anticipate any further surgeries to correct ocular albinism and nystagmus completely? Uh, no. Nystagmus is driven by things deeper in the brain. And yes, there are things that can be done to neutralize or paralyze <clears throat> the muscles that move the eye. But then my anxiety is you do have to turn your head more in some situations. And so at this point, I don't anticipate it, but that's a personal bias. I, you know, it's not my line of work, but I appreciate the question. Uh, question from Valeria. Due to low vision, can the kids with OA develop any nervous tics? Anybody can. But it's not the albinism. A question from Mary. We go to Perkins, but would uh, George benefit from coming to University of Texas to get help for anything? Um, I have forgotten. I mean, I don't know what Perkins is like now. I know that when I was growing up, um, I attended an ind independent school in West Roxbury called the Roxbury Latin School, which is the oldest independent continuously operating school in North America, founded in 1645. Despite my children's belief, I was not in the original graduating class. We had a fantastic re wrestling coach and a fantastic re wrestling team. And we lost only one match invariably every year we competed, and that was to Perkins. So I don't know what Perkins is like now, but that's that's probably the, the the king of low vision assistance in the greater Boston area. So I would think no. I, I'm... And and the other question of that is, what is the level of this gentleman's vision, vision sorry, that he's going to Perkins? And does he really have OA1? Does he have molecularly confirmed, DNA diagnostically confirmed OA1? Yes, yes, genetically, and it's 20 over 200. That's interesting. Hmm. The blindness that much. We just go for, uh, uh, you know, just uh, when he was young, you know, just to get a sense. And, sure, and sure. His, his regular public school has been very accommodating and has a consultant from Perkins Yes. every month. Okay, no, I think you're in good hands. Yeah, okay. thank you. I vouch for Perkins, too. I work there. <laughs> Um, I love this question from Kyle. How often is OCA misdiagnosed as ocular albinism? I, as a father, have it, and so does my son, but there's no obvious way his mother is a carrier. Uh, forgive me for being rude, but I already been through that one. It, this is an X-linked disorder. It's never transmitted from father to son, ever. So one or both of you does not have that diagnosis of OA1. You've got something else. And 
it's got to be OCA if you have the other features in nystagmus, iris translumination, reduced visual acuity, skin sensitivity to sunlight with easy burning, um, in which case, was molecular testing ever done on either of you, dad or son? And was it single gene testing for ocular albinism or was it testing multiple um, ocular cutaneous albinism genes? So I was tested. He has not been tested yet. I was recently tested. Um, there was one OCA2 gene that according to the geneticist wouldn't cause me to have albinism. Um, and they said they tested for a variety of ocular albinism and OCA genes. Yeah. Well, okay. That, that, thank you. That clarifies some of it. Um, so you have one gene, which is, you have one copy of one gene for OCA2, which is, quote, presumably pathogenic. Pathogenic mean disease causes. Yes, correct. That's what they said. Right? So, but you're absolutely right. One, one copy won't do it. So, and um, in that case, depending on what lab that panel, the, the panel that did the panel testing, um, either didn't cover it, um, and we get into some real subtleties here about genetic testing, yeah. that, um, uh, you know, it, 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 there are at least two possibilities. One, the second copy of that OCA2 gene, which immediately takes you out of the ocular albinism story. Um, the second, because it should have been easily to pick up, o OA1, uh, it should have been easy to pick up. Um, the second copy is there, but wasn't detected by the mechanic, the mechanics, the, the actual machine algorithm that did the analysis of the DNA. Or there's another cause, but it is an OA1. If you and your son have the same thing, I mean, that's pretty, pretty clear. So at that point, I, I think what, what I would do here is not necessarily what other people would do, depending on where, what part of the world you live in, uh, would be go to what's called an exome, E-X-O-M-E. -E, and that would be a trio exome. In other words, you get DNA from mom, DNA from dad, and DNA from your son. And um, the when, oh dear Lord, how I've lost track of it now, whenever it was in 2007 or something that the first human genome was analyzed and it cost X time million dollars. And people said, well, you, you can't do this for everybody. So what somebody figured out was instead of sequencing the entire genetic material, Um, they said, let's sequence the active part of a gene, of all the genes we know. The working part of a gene, like a, a um, set of the Encyclopedia Britannica, is made up of a number of volumes. Those volumes have binders, those volumes have preface pages, they have whatever, but the working part are all the stuff inside where the words are. You don't have to read the book, the covers of each book. You don't have to read the preface of each book. You have to read the words, the paragraphs. So the working part of a gene is an exon, E-X-O-N. And genes can have anywhere from one to three or 400 exons, even more than that in some. But you forget that there's stuff that holds these exons together. There are places in a gene which says, hey, there's an exon coming, get ready to read it here. And then, you, you know, then you start the paragraph three or four words down line. And what has happened in order to facilitate the cost savings is you're ignoring certain things that go into an exome, E-X-O-M-E, which is all of the exons put together. Um, and so you have to go to a more sophisticated testing and or a genome, which then really gets sophisticated, but also parenthetically with that goes up the cost. But I mean, there's got to be a solution. It's just you don't have it. So uh, again, we're back to you need to be in touch with 
a genetic counselor and or a geneticist, a clinical geneticist who has interest in this and says, damn it, there has to be an answer. We don't have it. How do we find it? Got it. Okay. So keep digging. Yes. Don't give okay. up until you have an answer. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, does the visual acuity of a father with ocular albinism have any relation to the visual acuity for his son with ocular albinism? Again. No. Except we're back to the same question. He doesn't have ocular albinism if the father transmitted it to his son. Right. Um, got something, and he may have ocular cutaneous albinism, but he ain't got ocular albinism, period, in a sense. The only time I've seen that is during my trips to Saudi Arabia. Uh, when I used to go to Saudi Arabia in the 1980s, into the early 1990s, you know, uh, the 55% of all the marriages in the kingdom at that time were between first cousins, first cousins once removed, or second cousins. In that situation, we saw a lot of recessively inherited diseases that we simply don't see in the United States because you don't have those kinds of inbreedings. And I have seen one son with um x-linked ocular albinism i'm sorry that's not correct one female with x-linked ocular albinism whose father had the disease and his mother who was his first cousin transmitted the other copy of the gene so he had a double dose this woman this girl had a double dose both of her x chromosomes had the oa1 variant on it and that poor woman was that poor child was devastated Wow, that but must be very unusual, though, right? There's no father-son transmission. Never occurs. Hasn't happened. That I know of. So if neither parent carries it, is it just a mutation? If neither parent... Well, wait a minute. Somebody's got to have it. Um, I mean, are you talking about ocular albinism or, or ocular cutaneous? Just ocular albinism. Neither one of us are carriers. It's a son. And he has molecularly confirmed ocular albinism. Yes. So he has an OA1 mutation. Correct. You don't Correct. have, so, say again? I don't carry it. You don't have the, the same OA1 variant. And obviously dad doesn't have it. Correct. So if yours is normal and dad's is normal, he's got to be a new mutational event. Yeah. I mean, the doctor told me he's like a one in a billion. Well, it, it happens. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but you know, he said I could have as many kids as I want and probably never have it happen again. Uh, I would be cautious about that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm done. Here, here's why that, here's where I would be cautious about that. I would have given you a five to seven percent probability for the following reason your blood was tested, your ova, your, your, genetic material in your ovaries was not tested so i have can imagine a situation where yes indeed that mutation came from you because it's got to be if your son is affected it's got to be on the x chromosome he didn't Correct. get his x from he didn't get his x chromosome from you he got his y chromosome from dad okay yeah. so that you could have this as a variant in your ovaries but not in your bone marrow that produces your blood cells and so that's why my daughter doesn't have it well that there, there's no reason well again the only way to i mean there are examples of this whereas if your daughter has been tested for that same variant and she doesn't have it she got one of the other 94 percent of eggs that don't have that variant in it. I made that number up. Um, okay, so I should have her tested for the exact same variant my son has? Oh, she hasn't been tested yet? No, I don't know if she's a carrier. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, if, in fact, if, in fact, your son has ocular albinism and has an OA1 variant. Correct. He, he either inherited it from you in some fashion 
or he didn't inherit it, in which case it's a new event. Somewhere between the time your eggs were created and he got one with an X chromosome on it. Okay. So it's a new event. But the solution to that one is to clarify it in, in her. And the eye exam is only loosely supportive because it should be normal. But if you want to, then, and it's going to have to be that same variant in her because there is a certain set of of par uh, females who have uh, a variant in their ovaries that happened long after their conception, which gave rise to all the other tissues in the body. Um, and it's just been sitting there idly until you were a teenager and started putting out eggs in menstruation uh, in, in your cycle. Uh, but since the mutation is known in the sun uh, and it's confirmed in the lab, the easy part is testing her with that same variant and taking it uh, off the list or unfortunately putting it on the list if it turns out to be the same mutation. But it's not going to be another one. It's going to be that one. Okay, thank you. That was helpful. But not, but to say it can't happen again is not true until you've tested to be sure. Um, one more from Jim. If the trio exome genetic testing that we had done for our son was inconclusive, as mentioned earlier, but our son has all of those features, what else could it be? Which is the one? When was what? Which one was that? It's the last question. Uh, Jim. I'm not sure what, and with no disrespect, I'm not sure what the word inconclusive means. Uh, genetic testing was inconclusive. How can we get him a diagnosis given that? And I think you said to keep going and ask another geneticist. Yeah, um, and have it have the exome have the exome reinterpreted. Okay. I mean, it, it, that's a very decent question. It's a very res very respectful and very logical question. Um, so, the, something else. And, and again, Mr. Norton, Norton, Mr. Norton, no disrespect here, but there's something that you and I don't know. <laughs> And uh, I I don't like the word inconclusive, and, and I mean not your choice of words, but the the fact that somebody would say that means there's got to be an answer. You don't have it, and so it, if you're, I I just it, it, I I gotta just on a probabilistic basis because OA one is such a relatively small gene and it's not that difficult to analyze four to six weeks you can get an answer back mm -hmm. but if he had panel testing and then exome and it was inconclusive it's more of more likely that the analysis of the exome was inconclusive rather than there's no answer there's an answer you don't have it <clears throat> thank you so ooh, one more sure please uh, from Gwenda, if we tried to prevent all things having biological children who could genetically inherit certain conditions from us, I suppose there would be a dramatic increase in having a oh, decrease in having children. I was an OA carrier and have a daughter who is a carrier, but I also have a son with a serious mental illness. Cancer is another example of this. Yeah, the story gets even more complicated because the more we know, the it's the the old analogy of the uh, the woodcutter in the middle of a forest. Uh, the the woodcutter starts cutting down trees, and the bigger the area of his knowledge, the longer the perimeter of his ignorance. Um, you know, we, it was always taught that humans had twenty two to twenty three thousand genes, until human genome was sequenced and now we have 30,000. It isn't it? We just gained 7,000. It means we didn't know about those. And God only knows what's silent that we don't know about yet. So I don't think we're through with that story yet. Um, and again, the spectrum between biological illnesses and 
mental illnesses is even more complicated. Um, I grew up in a family where my mother at age 42 went back into residency training in neurology and psychiatry because in that era, those were the same board. And if there was, and that was the Freudian era. And my mother used to come home and I know I used to see her, shake her head. I was in high school at the time or early high school. And my mother used to shake her head and said, the Freudians are wrong. These are organic illnesses. The Freudians are wrong. These are organic illnesses. And by God, 30 years later, she was absolutely correct. <laughs> more and more of them are developing biological explanations. And um, it's, you know, it, it's amazing. The, the doubling time of information in human genetics right now is less than two years. So we're trying to teach people in a training program that's three years old how to learn as well as what they need to know. And um, and unfortunately, the knowledge base is expanding faster than we keep up with it. Um, well, I think I could probably just ask you questions all night. I have more in my mind. <laughs> Um, but I did want to mention to everybody that Noah will be reaching out to everybody on this call with some future uh, programming for OA um, participants. Um, I, for one, will am hoping to lead uh, an OA Connections call every month or possibly every other month. Um, I think that we, uh, as caregivers um, and family members, we, we deal with a, a unique set of circumstances for kiddos with OA, there's a lot of, you know, family involvement, future things and um, genetics, hereditary. Um, and then there's also always the, I don't quite look typical. Um, my eyes move differently. I don't see the same, but I'm not blind either. So, um, you know, there's a little value in there that can be sometimes hard to navigate. Um, so I'm hoping that we can all find and develop a community here together. Um, and, I thank, and I want to thank all of you for your patience and your understanding and listening to me blithering over here for the last, that goodness knows, hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been so generous with your time. We truly, truly appreciate it. And this was fascinating. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank both of you for coming. That was very, very fascinating. And thank you to everyone who came. Um, we will be sending out a recording to everyone who signed up. So you can go back over the slides and stuff if needed. But thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you Good again, night. Dr. Thank Lewis you. and Pam. Welcome. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.